Hey guys, um, so I wanted to finish talking about the um, alternating series test. So here is a question that we might end up asking. If the series converges, how do we estimate the value of the series? How do we estimate the value of the series? This only makes sense if the series converges, right? If the series diverges, it's either tending to positive infinity or negative infinity, or the limit of the partial sums does not exist. Um, so this question only makes sense if my series converges. And we only know how to do this so far with the geometric series, right? So, but in general, if I'm trying to just estimate it, what I can do is truncate, right, my series, and then take a look at what the value of the partial sum is. So what do I do? I truncate the series and estimate the value of the partial sum. So truncation means that I'm throwing some terms away, and because I'm throwing some terms away, I'm going to get that error. So the next natural question is, what is the error when I'm truncating the series? How do I estimate that? How to estimate the error in truncation? And so here we're specifically talking about series that are alternating, they have an alternating sign. So for example, I could have negative one to the k plus one times a sub k inside of my series. And so if I write out the first couple of terms, the first sign is going to be positive. So I'm going to get a sub one minus a sub two plus a sub three minus something, then plus something. And let's call this term a sub n minus one the next term is going to be negative a sub n. And so these first n terms from one to n, I'm going to call this the nth partial sum. So this would be an estimation of my series. And if I continue on, I'm going to get plus a sub n plus one minus a sub n plus two plus and everything else. And so all of the terms that are after a sub n, they're going to be part of my error because that is the term, the terms that I am leaving out. And so we call this our error, or sometimes we call it our remainder. Okay, so visually what we have going on here is I'm going to have k on the x-axis and then the partial sum on the y-axis. And if my series converges, the limit of the partial sum will tend towards a specific value s. So s is the actual value of the sum. And so what the partial sums are doing here is they're going to oscillate around the value of s. So I will start with s sub n. This is where I'm truncating my series, right? So here I have n on the k-axis, and then I have some s sub n right here for the partial sum. If I take the next term over, it's going to be a little bit closer to s, but because the sign is flipping for a sub um, n plus one, it's going to overshoot it, right? So it's going to be somewhere here. This is n plus one on the k-axis, and this is s sub n plus one right here. 
So what do I want to look at? I want to look at the difference between S sub n, S sub n plus one, and then S, because I can come up with a relationship that is between all of these differences. So what is the actual error? The actual error is between the nth partial sum and then S, the actual value of the sum. So I'm going to put this difference here in red. So this is my actual error that I'm looking for. Some, something else that I can quantify as well is, let me do this in purple, is the difference between two consecutive partial sums. So this is S sub n plus one and S sub n, right? So I'm going to say that this is the absolute value of the difference between these two consecutive um, partial sums. And we actually do know a value of this in terms of A sub n's because of a pattern. And so we'll talk about that next. So we remember that the first partial sum is just the first term. The second partial sum is the first two terms. And if a1 is equal to s1, then s2 is equal to s1 plus a2. Then if I continue this pattern, s3 is going to be equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3. And a1 plus a2 is s2, so I have s2 plus a3. And so if I continue on this pattern, I'm going to get s sub n plus 1. That's equal to s sub n, the previous partial sum, and I'm adding to it a sub n plus 1. Right, so I actually have a quantity once I subtract s sub n from both sides. I have a quantity that's um, telling me the difference, relating the difference between two consecutive partial sums in terms of a sub n plus 1. So the absolute value of s sub n plus 1, subtracting from that the value of s sub n, that's going to be equal to, well, a sub n plus 1, like that. And the exact error that we wrote down on the picture, the exact error is between the nth, nth partial sum and the value, right? This is, this is what we want to put a bound on. So then we can say that the exact error for the remainder is going to be less than or equal to a sub n plus one, where the remainder is that value of the, uh, the difference between the nth partial sum and the actual value. So why is that? Why is that less than a sub less than the value of a sub n plus one? Um, that is because here the difference between s sub n plus one and s sub n is larger than the error between um, s sub n and s, right? So we know that because um, the consecutive partial sums are decreasing in magnitude and Right, that's because we are converging to that sum and we are overshooting and undershooting it just based on um, the flipping of the sign in the original alternating series, right? Okay, so with this in mind, let us state the error estimate and then we'll do an example. So error estimate for alternating series. It's kind of distracting having these uh, <laughs> um, zebra stripes on me, but that's okay. So what do I do? I let my alternating sum converge to some value s. And then I determine what is the remainder or the error for that sum. So R sub n is my remainder and it's the difference between the nth partial sum and the value of the sum. Then 
Then I have the following relationship. R sub n is less than or equal to a sub n plus one. A sub n plus one is the term, the next term in the series that we're throwing out. So if you take a look at the original series that we started off with, <clears throat> This one right here. So the nth partial sum goes up to a sub n, and then the next term in the sum is a sub n plus 1. So that's the next term that we're throwing out. So if I can find out what that is, then, well, I know what my error is as well. So error is bounded by the next term in the series that we throw out. in the series that we leave out. So that's a pretty neat relationship for alternating series. This is specific to alternating series. So let's do an example and then we'll finish up the rest of the activity. I will have two series and I want to know how many terms are needed to estimate the value of the sum to some error. The value of the series with error that is less than 10 to the negative six. So this is one over 10 to the six or one millionth. Right? And I don't actually need to know the value of the series. I need to know how many terms in the partial sum do I need to have in order to have this small of an error. So we will apply it to um, two series. So my first series is going to be 1 over k. Um, with negative 1 to the k. And then my other series is negative 1 to the k, 1 over k factorial. Right, so the regular harmonic series um, diverges, but because this I have an alteration of the sign, this converges to some value. And because it converges, I can estimate the value of the sum. So what do I know? I know the condition is that my error is has to be less than 10 to the negative 6. And the error itself is going to be bounded by a sub n plus 1. So a sub n plus 1 has to be less than 10 to the negative 6, right? The error is bounded by a sub n plus 1, so a sub n plus 1 has to be less than 10 to the negative 6. <clears throat> okay, well, what is a sub n? a sub n is 1 over n, so a sub n plus 1 is going to be 1 over n plus 1. Right, just going based on what is my generic term. So this has to be less than 1 over 10 to the 6. I cross multiply, 10 to the 6 is going to be less than n plus 1. And so 10 to the 6 minus 1 has to be less than n. So to choose an n such that my error is less than 10 to the negative 6, the first n that I could choose since n is an integer is I need to have a million terms, right? Choose n to be, well, 10 to the 6, 1 million. So then my sum with k going from 1 to 10 to the 6, negative 1 to the k, 1 over k is within 10 to the negative 6 of the actual sum. So that is a lot of terms. <laughs> um, we would not want to do this by hand. That's a little bit better. <clears throat> so now let's do this for the factorial. So same relationship, instead of uh, one, over k, one over n, I'm gonna get one over n factorial. 
Hold up, I'm trying, I'm gonna try to focus this. Yeah, nice, okay. So I'm going to have the following relationship. One over n plus one factorial has to be less than 10 to the negative six. And unfortunately, we can't quite come up with a mathematical relationship to do this. We have to, um, we have to try out a couple of terms. Um, so we have to do this um, numerically. Cannot do this algebraically. Okay, so let me try a couple of terms because I sort of know what the answer is. <laughs> uh, first, I'm going to check um, when n is equal to eight. So I have one over eight plus one factorial, which is one over nine factorial, and this is equal to zero point, and there's five zeros after that, and then it's two eight. So if I multiply this by 10 to the sixth power, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, that's still going to be greater than 10 to the negative six. So the error is not small enough. So I try the next term. One over nine plus one factorial. This is one over 10 factorial. And this is zero point, um, and then there's six zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's a two eight. And so this number is indeed less than 10 to the negative six. So how many terms do I need? I just need um, nine terms. That's a lot less than what I need for one over K. Right, so in this case, this checks out, and what do I do? I choose n is equal to nine, and then my partial sum, I'm going from one to nine of negative one to the k, one over k factorial, and then my partial sum is within 10 to the negative six of the actual value. So what is the difference between these two functions? I have one over k and one over k factorial. Why did I need a million terms for one of them and then only nine terms for the other one? It's because <clears throat> one over k factorial decays much faster than one over k. So it's going to converge to an actual value for the sum faster than one over k. Um, so that is why I need fewer terms for um, something that has factorials in there if I'm trying to estimate the value of the sum. So that is, that is a neat thing. Um, factorials decay quickly. Or I guess factorials grow quickly and one of our factorials decay quickly. <laughs> So now we're talking about the rates of convergence. So at this point, hopefully um, we have a good base to finish up the rest of the activity and I will see you later.